because a great anecdote doesn't leave people speechless. It leaves them competing to Ah. tell a better version of the same thing. And that's when a real writer just starts realizing, okay, there's a pattern, and that can be turned into something really big. What if there was a place you could go and get into a fight as casually as you would go ask someone to dance? What would the rules be for that place? And I would take the book and go through and use a highlighter to highlight all the stuff I I want to use, I want to use this, I want to use that, because the book has got a lot of stuff and it can't all go into the movie, right? And then sit down and stare at a blank screen for hours on end and be full of fear. I start thinking about, well, what are are some key scenes that I feel like would be in this project? Mm -hmm. Whether it's the climax or some other part of the film, and I try to write those scenes first out of order. As I call it, the scent of blood. <laughs> what happens is you are in it now, and you didn't start on Faded. It started as a, uh, it started on an afternoon at work, two o'clock in the afternoon, right after lunch. And I wanted to write a short story, and I wanted to experiment using rules as a transitional device. So I just had to come up with seven rules. Just arbitrary seven rules. What if, what if there was a place you could go and get into a fight as casually as you would go ask someone to dance? What would the rules be for that place? So I came up with these seven rules that would allow me to just jump around in time and place and topic uh, as long as I came back and and touched on a rule. And I wrote that story in half an hour. And that became chapter six of Fight Club. It was the first short story I ever sold to a magazine. This is your first night at Fight Club. You have to fight. I had gone on a vacation. I'd been hiking and camping. And I had gotten into a really big fight with some people over noise at night in the woods. You know, some people who just had to camp right next to our camp. Just had to bring some huge radio up to 3,000 feet on the Pacific Crest Trail and have a, some big blowout party in the middle of the night. And I came back to work at the end of my vacation with my face just bashed. My face was so awful and so trash that nobody would acknowledge it. Because to acknowledge it, somehow they would have to find out something about my private life they just did not want to know. And so for three months, as my face slowly changed color, eventually coming back to white, people would look at, at my chest and they would talk to my Adam's apple and they would say, so how was your weekend? Did you do anything interesting? And I'd be looking at them with two huge black eyes saying, no, how about you? If you looked bad enough, no one would dare ask you what you did with your free time. I showed this already to my man here. You liked it, didn't you? It was such a miserable time in my life. I was right out of college and I had a job doing something I, I, I hated doing. And I was so desperate that somebody said, come join my church. And when you're right out of college, you've left behind all of your social structure. You've lost all your friends. And I was so desperate to be with people that I went to church. And the church had a giving tree. And it was covered with ornaments. And you just plucked an ornament. And one ornament that I plucked said, take a hospice patient on a date. The idea was that you would go to a hospice and you would ask out someone who was dying and you would take them to see the ocean for the last time. And more often than not, it was, will you take me to my support group? I need a ride. So I would drive them to their support group and I would have to stay at the support group. And no matter how much I tried to hide, people would assume that I had whatever everyone had. And there was no polite way of saying, whoa, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, don't have hepatitis. Good for you, but not me. And so I started to kind of create this narrative in which a man attends these groups because the next day when I went back to work, I felt really good that no matter how shitty and boring my life had turned out with my journalism degree and all my student loans I still owed, at least I didn't have cancer. When people think you're dying, man, they really, really listen to you instead of just, instead of just waiting for their turn to speak. And can you talk a little bit about the phenomenon of the, the sort of popularity of it and then, and then the sort of, I guess a lot of people have started bike clubs, I guess, in the, in the aftermath of it. And that goes back to the Cacophony Society. 
because Cacophony was basically an organization of people who had really boring jobs. They were uh, letter carriers for the post office, they were bookstore clerks at Powell's, they were people who had really, you know, very structured hourly job lives. And they needed a way to have chaos in their lives for a very structured, like, window of time. You know, if we do this kind of a theme party, we can be crazy, we can be insane anarchists from four o'clock until midnight on Saturday night. And so it was a way of having completely structured chaos in your life and being able to schedule that every week. Uh, kind of an experiential potluck because people would host it, people would come up with concepts the way you did when you were kids and you would play a game. Okay, the boards, the boards are safe, but the ground is lava. So if you touch the ground, and you would do that, you just arbitrarily come up with rules. You know, the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk, you just come up with a rule and another rule and you invent the game instantly. And you have the freedom and the authority to do that. And, and Cacophony let us do that every week and give up our boring lives for you know, two or three hours. Fifth rule, one fight at a time, fellas. Fortunately, I sort of stylistically sort of melded with Chuck Polinick and um, put in the stuff where I put in my own material. It seemed to mix with where I was using stuff from the book. But the main thing was is that structurally, I had to put together something that worked as a screen story. Um, and I would take the book and go through and use a highlighter to highlight all the stuff I, I want to use, I want to use this, I want to use that, because the book has got a lot of stuff and mm -hmm. it can't all go into the movie, right? So um, I, would, I would do that and then sort of use that as a guide and then sit down and stare at a blank screen for hours on end and be full of fear. <laughs> <laughs> well, any novel has the advantage of being able to, to describe both external behavior and internal behavior, uh -huh. as well as any exposition that can be ladled on. Right. Screenplays don't have that luxury at all. It's watching external behavior. So even if you're faithful to a novel and a scene feels like it's faithful to a novel, if it works on screen, you have made changes to it uh -huh. because you are not using an internal narrative to uh, describe the interior process. And so I, I just say that it's, it, the thing that comes down with adaptations is you have to work as hard as you do on an original script uh -huh. because at the end of the day, what people want that you're turning it into is a workable screenplay. Right. If you turn into a producer or director or studio executive, an ungodly mess right. that's really faithful to the novel, you're gonna be replaced right. by another writer. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. Now, do you? How do you find the voice of a character, like as a writer? I mean, I know every writer is a little bit different, but how do you find your voice and your characters? Well, I'll put two of them together, and I'll just start writing scenes. Um, I like to do what's I call it writing outside the script, and there's various forms it takes. One is um, scenes that are well, they are scenes that are not going to be in the script. And sometimes they're just scenes that I put in any situation. And sometimes there are scenes that would come before the story of the script starts. And sometimes I interview the characters where it's, you know, I type Jim and I type my first question. I type <laughs> the character name and the answer. And I try to goad them, provoke them, get them angry, then get them, you know, suddenly talking in a sentimental way about some memory or something and then get them joking and laughing and basically just get them all over the range with questions and um, you know it starts off it's, it's it's very very mechanical at first but they sort of start to come alive in an interview things you own end up owning you during the the, the writing of it or the crafting of it did you ever suffer kind of a roadblock or any any type of writer's block in the in the in the in the, just the the crafting of it, or do you ever have you ever experienced that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that happens a lot. Either before I start something, um, which is really in a way kind of worse, mm -hmm. because there's nothing that you're right. blocked from that you need to get back to. Right. You just 
you're blocked and you're not starting something. Um, but in either case, what I try to do is my experiments, like my interviews with the characters. Mm -hmm. um, I also find that if it's an idea, and I pretty much know the idea, but I feel really blocked about how to shape it, mm -hmm. I start thinking about, well, what are, what are some key scenes that I feel like would be in this project? Mm -hmm. Whether it's the climax or some other part of the film, and I try to write those scenes first out of order. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, I call it the scent of blood. <laughs> what happens is you are in it now, and you didn't start on fade in, right? but you're, you're in the script, and it can kind of grow out from inside instead of page one. Right. And that's, I, I found it to be very effective to get through blocked. So like, I, I find a lot of blocks happen sequentially right. while you're going in linear fashion and you just can't figure out what the connective tissue or the transition is right. at this part of the story. I say, skip it. Right. <laughs> Go over to this part where you really have some feeling and write that. And I think that's a good way of staying in it. You met me at a very strange time in my life. But unless you're rustling feathers, even within workshop, you're not going far enough. You know, I loved writing that line in Fight Club uh, where Tyler and Marla have sex for the first time. And the, the most romantic thing that, that Marla can say is, I want to have your baby. So what is the inverse? So of course, Marla turns to him and she says, I hope I got pregnant because I really want to have your abortion. And that's the line that the movie studio went around and around. And even Brad Pitt said, you know, my mom's gonna see this movie. I, I don't want her to see this line. <laughs> and they shot that scene with so many different substitute lines. And then finally Fincher wrote the line. And Helen Bonham Carter says, I haven't been fucked like that since grade school. And at that point, 20th Century Fox said, can we switch it back to the abortion line? <laughs> <laughs> and so, Unless you're always kind of pushing to kind of, you know, until you get some pushback, you don't feel like you're pushing hard enough. And so pushback is not a bad thing. It's just kind of a, it's proof that you're doing your job. The shit that came out of this woman's mouth, I never heard. Now, when you approach a novel like that, when you have a story like that that's brewing your head, how do you decide what to pull the trigger on? Like, do you just go on instinct? Do you just have a, a concept in your head and it just seems more and more attractive and you just say, okay, this is it? You know, one really good test is if you can take it to a party and you can tell a very small part of it, as much of it as you know at that point, and people will vie for a chance to relate some aspect of their life that is very much like that, but an even more extreme example of that. So in a way, they're, they're, they're fleshing out your theme with parts of their own lives. And so you find yourself drawing from the experience of dozens or hundreds or thousands of people. And at the same time, you're beta testing it. You're kind of taking it on the road and you're seeing that it's an idea that res resonates with a, a huge number of people, that everyone can relate to it. Hmm, that's interesting. So do you purposely like go to parties with like uh, a, a couple like bullets in the chamber? Sometimes, or sometimes I just go to the party and I listen to hear somebody tell that, that personal anecdote that does evoke all those other anecdotes. Because a great anecdote doesn't leave people speechless. It leaves them competing to ah. tell a better version of the same thing. And that's when a real writer just starts realizing, okay, there's a pattern. And that can be turned into something really big. That's really interesting. Working jobs we hate, so we can buy shit we don't need. My classic thing is that there are so few social model novels or stories for men. For, for women, there are, a, you know, every season, there's a new Joy Luck Club, a new How to Make an American Quilt, a new traveling sisterhood of the Yaha pants, <laughs> whatever. Just all these different models in which women can come together and talk about their lives. And if you're a man, you've got either Fight Club or you have the Dead Poet Society. And that is really it. So we don't have a lot of narratives that, that depict to men a role or a kind of script of, you know, uh, in which to come together 
and talk about their their shed. Another thing is uh, Jordan Peterson. Back to Jordan Peterson. He talks about that need for really rough play. You know, we've kind of fallen away from this idea of consensual rough play. And I think Fight Club resonated with that a lot. And also the idea of Joseph Campbell's idea that there needs to be a secondary father in men's lives. That you're born, if you're lucky, with a biological father that you do not choose. And that is the, the nurturing, loving father that you eventually kind of have to reject. But in doing so, you have to choose a new father. And that, that father by choice typically is a, a minister or a teacher or a drill sergeant or a coach, one of those fathers. And you kind of put yourself in apprenticeship to the secondary father. And you have to sort of consign your life to the secondary father and agree to learn what they're going to teach you. Uh, just like in Karate Kid. Mm. And that is getting harder and harder and harder to find. So Fight Club was also depicting a new form of the secondary father with all these, these kids that were showing up on the doorstep of this ramshackle old house. So there were just so many aspects of men's lives that were not being addressed when Fight Club came out. And it sort of reinvented so many of those things that had fallen by the wayside. Trust me. Everything's gonna be fine. <laughs>